Lord God, we thank you. We bless you. We worship you. We exalt you. We extol you. All the honor that's due your name, we give it to you. There's none like you. You're in a class all by yourself. Hmm. You dwell in inapproachable light. But you allow us to come into your presence. You call us your daughters if we know you through Christ. We call, you call us your friends. You say that we can cry out to you, Abba, Father. And so we thank you that you're not far away and unattached. We thank you that you know the very number of hairs upon our head, Lord God. We thank you that you did knit us together in our mother's womb. We thank you that you know all and you see all. We thank you that you have all power and that nothing escapes you. You're so awesome that nothing has ever occurred to you because you already know it. And so it's you that we honor today. It's you that we lift up. Thank you. It's you that we lift on high. And so we give this time as an offering to you. And we ask that you be pleased, that it make you smile, that you be honored, that you be glorified, that you be lifted up. Huh. Take over. Hide me behind your cross that your word might come through. Let me be your mouthpiece and that's it. If we don't leave with a conviction around your word, then it was for nothing. Remove every distraction. Confuse the plan of the enemy and do your work. Do your work. The work that only you can do to draw us unto you. Cause every heart and every mind to be focused and ready right now. Cause every ear to be open right now. Cause every eye to be open right now. Whatever your intention is for this time, I pray that it come to pass. Whatever your word is for us, let us hear it. And not just hear it, but do it. We've done enough talking. And it's time to walk. It's time to do. It's time to be built up and sent out to do your work. Playtime is over. It's time. It's time. And this is your time. And I thank you that you're going to use this time in accordance with your will and, and your way. I pray a blessing over every heart in this room right now. Touch their homes. Touch their hearts. You know what they're going through. You know what they've been through. You know about the sleepless nights. You know about the anxiousness. Your word says that you take our tears and you put them in a bottle. Hmm. Have your way. Do what you do. And be glorified, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't know if I mentioned this already, but my name is Kelly. Uh, my husband is the pastor of our church, LeVert Parker. He's the pastor of Christ Community Church. And um, we've just kind of been doing these series of the gathering to get women together, to encourage us, to um, just give us encouragement from the word and encouragement from one another. So the last time we were together, what we talked about was what it means to be a woman of faith. And I kind of just want to pick up where we left off the last time. And I know what you're thinking, either A, I wasn't here last time, <laughs> or I really don't remember what we talked about the last time. Well, that's okay, because... I'm going to kind of segue us into it. So the last time we talked about being a woman of faith, and it was springtime, and we had ice cream, and we wore dresses, and it was fun. So because it was spring, we were talking about flowers and newness and all that goes along with springtime. And we talked about a woman of faith being like a flower. Why? Because she's growing, and she is... That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. She is growing, and she's beautiful, beautiful from the inside. The scripture talks about an inward beauty. But the last point was that a woman of faith appreciates the seasons, and we know that flowers and plant life goes through seasons. And so that's kind of where I want to jump off today. You'll notice three different scenes, and you might have recognized these scenes in your own life. Sometimes you're in the top left corner where everything is great, and the sun is shining, 
And it's awesome. It can't, get, it can't get any better than that. But sometimes you transition over there to the right where it's like a little bit of sun, but then it's also some clouds or some stuff going on. But sometimes you get down here and you're on the road and you see that you're in the middle of something crazy and you think that you're getting ready to be taken out of here because it's so serious. What we talked about is that this is, a, frankly, the cycle of life, right? That we're cycling in and out of this at any given time. We're cycling in and out of this. So today, really what I want to focus on is that bottom left corner. Because it gets tough sometimes. But I'm thankful for the word of God. It says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Hence our theme today, knocked down, but not destroyed. That's you. That's you. Any given day of your life, you're getting knocked down, you're getting slapped around. But I want you to know that in Christ, you might be knocked down, but you're not destroyed. It's not over. It's hope in Jesus. You walk in that. It's victory in Jesus. You walk in that. So I guess our subtitle for today will be the beauty of the storm, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So if you have your Bible, we are going to make our home in John chapter 11. Ready? All right. John chapter 11. I'm going to read actually a pretty lengthy passage here. I want us to get the full effect of what's going on. John chapter 11, I'm going to begin at verse 1, and I'm going to read all the way until verse 45. Are you ready? You with me this morning? Okay. Hold on to your hat. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. This is John chapter 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Verse 13, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. So Jesus had to break it down. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Verse 15, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. I call that a pretty hopeless situation, wouldn't you? He already been dead for four days. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. We're going to keep going. Are you, are you still there? Okay. Verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Verse 36, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Last verse, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. I want to talk about the beauty of the storm. Now, if anything is a storm, this is a storm. These sisters, they love the Lord. They have authentic relationship with the Lord. Doesn't it say in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus? So it begs the question, Lord, if you love me, why do you allow all, allow all manner of drama in my life? I want to talk about the purpose of the storm. Then I want to move into some pitfalls that we often face when we're faced with the storm. And finally, a plan. How many know that if you, what do they say? If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Your life is always cycling, right? So if you ain't in the middle of something, you're getting ready to go into the middle of something. And so we need to have a plan of attack ready. We need to always be in attack mode and ready for whatever the next step around the corner might be. So looking at the purpose of the storm, Don't miss this. To glorify God. Don't miss that. Does it not say in verse 4, Jesus said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for what? The glory of God. So that the Son of God may be what? Glorified through it. What about verse 40? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see what? the glory of God. So it seems to be some type of connection between people believing and God being glorified, right? Verse 15 says, I'm, and this laid me out. Jesus said, I'm glad that I wasn't there. Why? So that you may believe. So that I might be glorified. He said, I'm glad that it happened. Why? So that I could be glorified. Verse 42 
It's all about people believing in him. And did you catch in verse 45 how because of all that happening, that Jews were coming to faith in Jesus Christ? Did you know that your life was about more than your comfort? You know, glory is a word that we throw around in the church a lot. It's kind of hard to define. It's kind of like beauty. How would you describe beauty? It's kind of easier to say, well, that's beautiful or that's beautiful. So it's kind of difficult to describe. So I'm actually going to attempt to describe it or give you a little bit of picture what it means to glorify God by illustrating the relationship between glory and holiness. Are you with me? Tell me you're with me. I need to hear it. Tell me you're with me. Okay. Your purpose here on this earth is to glorify the Lord. I think that the word um, points to a relationship between God's glory and his holiness. Where am I getting that from? You can write this down and look at it later. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. You might know this passage. It's where the, the angels are proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of your holiness. No. No. Your glory. Yeah? Yeah. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 3. I read it to you. Listen. God says, I will be shown to be holy among those who are near me, and before all the people I will be glorified. In a sense, God's glory is a representation of the essence of who he is, of what makes him in a category all by himself. What makes God in a category all by himself? His holiness. He's perfect in every single way. So when you and I exude that characteristic of Christ, we bring him glory. When we make God's holiness known to the world, it brings him glory. It brings him honor. God says, I will be shown holy among all the people. To say it another way, I will be glorified. So to apprehend, to know his holiness in some sense is to perceive his glory, who he really is, because he's holy. That's him. That's who he is. In some kind of way, it's to glorify him. That's what you were made to do. Did you know that you were made to glorify him? Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. All things were made by him and for him. You were put on this earth to glorify him. How do we glorify him? By exuding that holiness in every single way. So let me explain a situation where that can just be put on steroids. When all the lights go out in your life, not your physical lights because you didn't pay your bills. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when it, the drama, I mean when, when disaster strikes and you stand up on the word of God. Come on now. Because everyone would be expecting you to go crazy, right? But in the middle of all that drama, when you're like Mary and you're like Martha and you say, I know who Jesus is, I know who you are, and nothing is going to convince me otherwise that he is glorified. Anybody can praise, praise him when the sun is out. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. It brings him maximum glory in the midst of all the mess when you lift your hands and say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. It brings him glory. Huh? Wow, wow, wow. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what you were put here for. It's all about him. And we all say, yeah, yeah, that's true. I like that. I like that. But you know what? You know what our tendency is? is to take that back. I want that glory. I want it to be all about me. I want you to think I'm smart. I want you to like me. I want to fit in. It's not about you. Woo! It's not about you feeling good. Ha ha. Listen, listen, listen. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. It just means that his paramount focus in your life is that he be glorified because that's what you were made for. How many people know you have to do what you were made to do or you're going to be out of sorts? Huh? You ever tried to use a toaster to, to bake a steak? It didn't work. That's you trying to live for you. Putting the steak in your toaster, talking about what's the problem. You were made for him. You were made for this. 
Let me tell you something. You were made for the storm. Uh-oh. See, this ain't, this ain't popular, but I want you to know you were made for this. Whatever you're going through today, you were made for this. Let me tell you something. The spirit of God that, that, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. And you were made for this. Listen, listen, listen. Stop walking around with your head hanging down because things ain't going right. Let me tell you something. He's victorious. He gives us the victory. He always causes us to triumph. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. Hey. Let me tell you something. You will never be satisfied until you give him glory. You'll never be satisfied until you give him glory. you always be searching. There's a longing on the inside of you that just wants to glorify him. Oh, yes. And we suppress it. We suppress it. We suppress it. But there's a longing on the inside of you that just wants to bring him glory. Whoo. But when it hurts, that's when he takes it and he magnifies it and he puts you on display. Ooh. Oh, my goodness. What is this? It's an ad. Somebody said it's an ad. What's the point of this ad? Why? Why'd they make this? Make you want to buy it. The ad is not about this woman. It's not about the color of her nail polish. It's about whoever made it, right? It's supposed to point you back. To Revlon, go to the store and get you some Revlon. Revlon is all that. That's the point of this ad. The point is not for you to take it out of the magazine and say, oh, this ad is so beautiful and I like the paper. Oh, wow, look at that. That's not what this is about, right? Let me say this right here. You're the ad. That's you. You're the ad. And everything about you is supposed to point back to him. It's not about you. It's not about this woman. It's not about anything here. It's about him. He gives you a platform called your life in which to glorify him. And it's got to point back to him. You are the ad. You know, there's a such thing as a good ad and a bad ad. Which one are you? You know, some ads make you really want to get the thing. Like, oh, I got to get me some honey buns. I'm hungry. <laughs> you know? And some of them look crazy. I don't want that. You have to make them look gorgeous. That's what bringing them glory is, is to make them look gorgeous to the world. Whew. The other thing about glorifying God is that when we go through the storm, you start to see something. The insufficiency of human effort, right? You begin to come to the end of yourself, and boy, oh boy, do you realize I need Jesus. Another purpose of the storm is to increase your faith. Over and over again in the passage, we talk about um, believing. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? God is trying to get, to you, get you to a point of immediate faith, immediate trust, and immediate obedience. That even um, if you don't understand it, that you trust the process. How many of you know that this walk is a process? We're trying to get to a goal, like a big house or whatever your thing is, like a perfect day. I don't know. We're trying to get there to that thing. And it's a process. The goal is the process. It's to know him. The Bible says that eternal life is to know him. Look at verse 39, where Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And isn't that what we do? We're in the middle of something. Something's happening. And you know what God wants you to do. And you got questions. You got feedback. Well, you know, that don't make sense because he's been in the grave. Hello? God is saying, even if you don't understand it, would you just trust and believe? Then he said in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Do it anyway. Even if it doesn't make sense, God is leading us to a point that we trust him regardless. Think about this. The Bible says that, God is seated on the throne. And I always think about when I'm, when I'm going through something, what is God's temperament? Is he, like, stressed? Like, what, is, what is he doing when I'm just stressing? What is he doing? Well, I'm comforted to know that he's seated. Why did I say that? What, what are you doing when you're seated? You're in control. You're not, oh, my God, what is she going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do with this. That's not what he's doing because he's in control because he knows that he has this. And I'm comforted by that. But on the flip side, I think we see the other side in this passage in verse 35. What does it say? It says, Jesus wept. That he really does, he feels our pain. That he relates to us on every single level. 
And that's a comfort to know. You got to trust the process. You know, my kids, my daughter is seven, and she's got this hair. And you guys have hair, and you know how it is. And now everybody going natural, so we really know how it is. It's a process, okay? I mean, you got to wash it. Then you got to condition it. Then you got to detangle it. Then you might have to braid it into the plaits, maybe. Then you might have to, I mean, it's just a, a day by day, a minute by minute thing. And that's how it is with the Lord. As he's trying to increase our faith and increase our love for him, he's taking us through a process. There's a book by an author named Terry McFadden, and it's called Only a Woman. And she talks about endurance. And she said endurance is to suffer but never surrender. And that's what God is, is, is putting in us, is to suffer but never surrender. Know this. What you go through is not just for you. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 22, Jesus says to Peter, that Satan desires to sift you like wheat. And I just say, well, Lord, well, then just pray, pray that he don't sift me. Ask him not to sift me. Right? The scripture says, Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you what? That your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, Strengthen your brothers. We have to begin to share our stories of what God is doing. Hmm. In regard to God's glory, we have to be taken to the point where nothing else matters but his glory. Not our reputation. Not our position or our power. Nothing. Nothing matters but his glory. And he does that by increasing our faith in him. It's interesting because God knows that we better understand him by experiencing him, right? It's one thing to read that he'll be your provider. It's another thing not to have no food, and he provides for you. Hmm. <laughs> that, that's a whole other situation, right? It's another thing. Think about Hagar. Think about her wandering in the, in the wilderness, having no one, feeling so lonely. She got to know him in a new way that day. She gave him a name. She said, I call you Elroy, the guy who sees me, because she went through that. See, can't nobody tell her nothing after she walked through it and experienced it. And he's taking you to a point where you're going to know him by experience. It's not just a textbook faith. You, you put feet to the thing. And so that's a good thing. The other thing I want you to take note of is in verse 35. I'm sorry, verse 25. Now, we can jump back to verse 23, actually. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Then Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. When you're going through something, God has a way of illuminating truth and revealing truth in a new way about him that you probably wouldn't have recognized before. And that's what he's doing for her. She's getting to know him in a way that nobody can take away from, from her. Another thing to keep in mind is that God is not random, right? Like I tend to say stuff and it's not connected or I lose my train of thought or whatever. He's not like that. Every single thing that he takes you through and every season that you go through is all laser focused on accomplishing the purpose that he has for you. He's very strategic that way, right? So... Nothing in your life is coming out of left field. He's working it all together to accomplish the purpose that he has for your life. There's no outliers for you. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, we've talked a little bit about the purpose of the storm, and it's to glorify our Lord. But I also want to go into... Some pitfalls, because I think we kind of had a f feel of that. You know, that's, we all say that. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Now it's all about Jesus. He knew that. But life happens, and there are things that we go through that get in the way. I'd like to talk about some of them. Deception. Yeah, get ready. So here's the thing. Deception is when you start to believe things about God or yourself or your situation 
that are not true. Right? Something like this. I'm going through this and God don't love me. If he loved me, he, this wouldn't be happening to me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't have a plan for me. I shouldn't be going through this. Why is this happening to me? I don't believe this. Da 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 da. God is blah, 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 and on and on it goes. And it starts right here, right? You get to thinking. Thinking. We have to be in a constant state of preparation. Because you know the storm is coming. If you're not in it, it's coming in some kind of way. Something is coming. So you always have to be in a state of preparation and preparing your mind and how you think. We have to process everything through the truth of Scripture. Why? Truth always liberates. Truth always liberates. But when we begin to get deceived and get off in our thinking, it always brings bondage. Take you back to the Garden of Eden, right? Everything was fine, and then people started believing, God don't want the best for you, honey. Go ahead and eat. I mean, you, you, you already know that. And now look at us. Man is born a slave to sin because we believe the lie. So we don't, we don't have time to believe in, be believing and entertaining thoughts of God not loving you and caring about you and all that. We have to be laser focused on what is the truth about God and live life through that lens. I just mentioned a book a couple of minutes ago called uh, Only a Woman. In that book, the author makes a point about God preparing us to be a champion. You know what a champion is? A champion is somebody that has prepared. They have trained and they have prepared and they're ready to accomplish a task. On the other hand, a hero is somebody that might show courage in a situation, but they're pretty much untrained or unprepared. God wants you to be a champion. That you're ready, when the storm comes, you're already ready. That your mind is already prepared. When the enemy comes with his attack, you can tell him, no, 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 no. This is what the word of God says. When the storm comes, it's too late. Did you know that? Listen, listen. When they say put up on the TV, it's a tornado coming, take cover. When you see the twister in your window and it's coming for you, it's too late. You have to already be ready. You hear what I'm saying? When, when the storm comes down, it's too late to be trying to run out to the store for batteries. Yeah. The time is right now because you know it's coming. Watch your eye gates and your ear gates. Listen to what I'm saying. Watch what you let into you because it affects how you think. Be careful. See, we so, we're spiritually dull. We don't pay no attention to what we do. We don't pay enough attention. It affects how you think. Quit thinking that you can do anything and it don't affect you. Where do we get that from? Listen, the storm is coming and it's real. And if your mind is as sharp, the enemy will have his way with you. You'd be an easy target. You know what an easy target is? That's easy. I'll take her out real quick, get her discouraged. Ain't, ain't no thing. She don't even know her Bible. Mm -mm. It's time out for that. Do the things that, that fill your mind with things of God. So here's the thing about deception. It leads us into a thought pattern that's just super unhealthy. So I think here's a good principle. I don't know if anybody has ever um, read or gone through the workbook called Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. It's an awesome study. But one of the points that he makes is that you cannot interpret God's character in light of your circumstance, right? This is important. You can't say, well, this is bad, so God is bad. This is bad, and God don't know what he's doing. This is bad, so... Mm -mm. You got to start with what you already know to be true about God, and through that lens, you interpret your situation. Well, I know God is good. I know he loves me. I know he cares for me. I know he's going to work everything for my good. Hmm. I know he sits high and he looks low. I already know that. So let me filter my situation through what I already know to be true about God. And that's how you're going to stay here and not here and there and everywhere. Well, it can't be. God is. No, you know that. Look, look back over the course of your life and tell me God ain't good. Hey. So we 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 got to get to that place where we're not so moved. We're always rocked. We're always shaken by something. You got to be in that place where you're steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know the Word of God. You have to walk in that truth. Listen, you have to recognize when your mind is getting off. Sometimes you know you're not thinking right. Am I telling the truth? You know you're not thinking right. You know what you're thinking ain't right. Make another choice. God ain't good. Make another choice. Yes, he is good. Make another choice. Stop entertaining stuff that you know ain't right. 
You've been walking with God too long not to be saying that God ain't good. We get deceived. Sometimes we just get discouraged. You ever been there? Think to yourself, self, I'm discouraged. But no one can make me stay discouraged. That's a choice that I have to make. You see, what, you see where I'm going with this? So get you a memory verse, get you something, call some, I don't know. But when you see that you're in that place, make another choice, right? Just like the psalmist says in uh, Psalm 34, he says, I will bless the Lord. That's a choice. That's saying what I'm going to do, come what may, I will bless the Lord at all times. And that's what you got to do. I'm not feeling it, but I will bless the Lord. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I will bless the Lord. Hmm. I don't know how it's going to end, but I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times, I will. Listen to me. My husband said this a couple weeks ago at church. I thought it was good. He said, you acknowledge what you see. I, you know, this is, it is what it is. You acknowledge what you feel. I feel sad. I feel down. Acknowledge what you hear. But you don't walk in that. You walk in truth. You feel it, and you move on. You feel it, and you move on. You have to feel it. You can't pretend you ain't feeling it. But you, got, you can't stay there. You can't stay there. It's time to come out of some stuff. It's time to come out of some stuff and walk in truth. All right. Anger, right? And a lot of these spawn off of being deceived, right? Because you get deceived about the situation. You start believing, well, I deserve better than this. You, you, you miss. Wait a minute. You, you were created for him. You were created for him. He's the one that dictates what the plan is. You're like, I don't, I don't have to do this. I don't, I don't need this. He's like, no, no, baby, I know what you need. I'm, I'm giving you the amount of sun and rain and everything you need for maximum growth. I know what you need. So once again, you feel it. You think God can't handle the fact that you're angry? What do you think he would do if you said, God, I'm angry? What would happen? You think the heavens would shake? <laughs> I believe that if we come to him sincerely, this is what I'm going through, that he will meet us there and show us how to get to a good place. He ain't scared of your feelings. But don't, don't stay in it. We can't stay in it. All right, come on, come on, guys. I got eight. All right, complaining. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is, something's going on, and I'm expressing my discontentment and my dissatisfaction with what's happening, right? And there is a such thing as venting, right? But the difference is you can't, you can't stay there. You can't stay there. Another thing is, it's just, it's just a very dangerous thing to do. The scripture says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 to do everything without complaining, right? Instead of complaining, you know what we should be after? Contentment. Now, that's not easy, is it? Contentment. The scripture says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, being satisfied. Lord, take me to a place where I'm satisfied with where you have me. I don't like it, but take me to a place where I can be content because I have you. If I have food and clothing, I ought to be satisfied. I'm turning. I ain't even said what the scripture is. But, um, <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, I want you to see something. Philippians chapter 4. This is good. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 11. You there? Verse 11. Paul says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have, look at this, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, this is interesting because the next verse we quote a lot. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Normally when we talk about that verse, we're saying, I can be a doctor if I want to. I can be a lawyer if I want to. I can do all things. And you can. But when you read it within the, the, the context, you understand he's saying, I give you strength in any I give you strength to suffer. You can, you can suffer. He gives you strength to go through whatever. 
That's what you can do. You can do all. You can go through anything through Christ who gives you strength. You hear that? So when the enemy comes, the thoughts, I can do all things through Christ. I can go through this. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it through him who gives me strength. Ha! Huh. The other thing is, we have to get better control over our mouths, right? Because we spend so much time complaining, but the mouth is such a powerful tool. So when we get in a tight situation, you have to be careful what you're doing with your mouth. You have to be very, very careful. Really, we need to be doing something that's very awkward and very foreign during a tough time, which is thanking him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. A couple of things with that. You might not give thanks for everything, but we ought to give thanks in everything. The other thing that's interesting is that it says that this is God's will. Aren't we all searching for God's will? What is God's will for my life? I've got to know it. Does he want me to go to England and be a missionary? I don't know. But what is main and plain in the scripture that he wants for you? He, one, of, think, one thing is he wants you to be thankful. Be thankful. You have to learn how to turn that thing around and to use your mouth to fuel your faith rather than make you more discouraged. Oh, dear sisters, dear sisters. You know, well, what time is it? All right, I won't say that. I'll keep going. All right, self-pity. Feeling sorry for yourself, down in the dumps. It's, it's kind of a self-indulgent attitude, right? Concerning your own difficulties, your own hardships. Oh, woe is me. It's never going to get better. It's kind of like Eeyore on Winnie the Pooh. Oh, my. Never going to get better. Never going to change. What am I going to do? Look. I think he's trying to get us to the point. Once again, it's not about you. What's funny about self-pity is really an expression of pride because it's all about you. And we wouldn't expect that, but it is. Here's a quote from John Piper. I'll read it. I'll try to read it um, clearly. Boasting is the response of pride to success. Self-pity is the response of pride to suffering. Boasting says, I deserve admiration because I have achieved so much. Self-pity says, I deserve admiration because I have suffered so much. Boasting is the voice of pride in the heart of the strong. Self-pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the weak. Boasting sounds self-sufficient. Self-pity sounds self-sacrificing. The reason self-pity does not look like pride is that it appears to be so needy. But the need arises from a wounded ego. It does not come from a sense of unworthiness, but from a sense of unrecognized worthiness, meaning you're worth more and no one is recognizing everything that you're doing or whatever. It is the response of unapplauded pride, right? When I look back at um, John chapter 11 that we read, this really takes me to verse 41, where it says, John chapter 11, verse 41, where God is getting ready to raise Lazarus, and he says, it says, so they took away the stone, and it says, Jesus lifted up his eyes. And I like that. I believe that we have to lift up our eyes. Look around you. It's a lot going on around you. It's about more than you. It's people that even in the midst of your mess could use you, that you could be serving and, and be ministering to, even in the midst of your drama. And then he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around. See, Christ is always concerned about the bigger picture. But sometimes we get really stuck in our world and we think that the only thing that matters is like right here, right? And he's trying to get us out of that. Um, there's a show that I like. I don't know if you guys like it, but it's called 19 Kids and Counting. I like that show. So... It's like a conservative Christian family, and they literally have 19 kids. But what I like about it is that they really live out what it means to be a Christian, and they're really serious about their faith. And so one acronym that they use in their family is JOY, which stands for Jesus first, then others, and yourself last. And I thought that um, 
I think that's a good way to look at it. You know, life is rough. The things do get real, but he's still good, and he's still wanting to use us for, for his purposes. Okay, next up on the list is denial, right? Denial is refusal to recognize or acknowledge the situation, right? I find that this can especially come into play when it comes when we get before other people, right? You don't want nobody to really know all that's going on with you. You know, how you doing? Good, girl. <laughs> and not that everyone needs to know everything that's going on with you, but it's just the idea that we live in a time where we think that people will perceive that as a weakness, and we don't want anybody to see any kind of weakness in us. We might have been burnt before, and I don't want anybody to see anything like that in me. But I challenge you with this. When Christ was raised from the dead and then he um, appeared after his death, what did he do? What did he show? His scars. His scars. And what did it bring? It brought God glory because the people were able to see how God was working. Show them. Show your scars. Say, hey, look, this, this, is, this is me. This is where I am in my life. This is, this is what he's doing over here. This is what I went through. This is what he did. And it glorifies him. And that's hard because it doesn't glorify you. That's what we want. We want, we want to be the subject of the ad, right? It's like, no, show it. Show it because it shows my power. Don't deny it. This is the very platform that I'm going to use to bring people unto me. And if you're not there yet, if you say to yourself, look, I, frankly, I'd rather have the glory. Then you need to let him know that so he can work on you. Okay? This is, it's, a, it's a process. Say, I'm not there yet. I would rather be liked. I would rather be comfortable. And let him do the work. Let's keep going. Detach. Detach. What do I mean by that? Some of us, when times get hard, we quit coming to church, we keep coming around, don't answer nobody's calls, I'm just here with it. Lose connection. I'm disengaged. I detached. Right? That's not his will. Let me just say that. The imagery in the Bible is that the believers are a body, and the body needs every part. So when you go back into your cocoon, it, it, it disenables everybody around you. Everybody else that's in the body is missing you, missing your gifts, missing your smile, missing your encouragement, whatever it is. Right? We function as a body because it's about more than just you and your deal. This is a tough one, especially for us women, I think. Right? It's hard to have relationships with other women. Can I, can I tell the truth in here? It is. We probably all had a situation with somebody at some time or another. You're like, I don't need this mess. <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> Flat out, I don't need it. I don't, I don't really need to mingle. I don't need to engage like that. Thank you. <laughs> Got enough on my plate, please and thank you. You know what I mean? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to smile. Mm, hello. Mm, church hug. And, I, and I'm back at the house because I don't have time for that mess. Right? But that's not his will. Let me tell you something. Your negative situations don't negate what the word of God says for you. Right? We need each other. The word says iron sharpens iron, right? So if you're in the habit of doing that, you're probably pretty dull at this point, okay? It's time to sharpen it up. So ask the Lord for wisdom, okay? I'm not saying you jump up here and you talk about in 1955 what happened. And that's not always the case, but ask them to lead you to some authentic relationships with some people that can hold you accountable, that you can connect with, that can remind you. Sometimes you just need reminding. Sometimes you get out your mind. Sometimes you get to talking crazy. Or is it just me? Like, man, what am I doing? I'm like the disciples. I'm going to go back to fishing. I'm going to go back to what I was doing because this ain't working. This, this Jesus thing. You need somebody who's going to walk with you. And that's why God designed it that way. So I pray that he bring us to a point where we can do that. This is the final one, escape. This is an interesting one. This is kind of like a cousin of denial where we feel like a prisoner to our circumstances and things, and so we're looking for freedom. That's what an escape would do. We're looking for freedom. We're just trying to find an escape, right? So sometimes addictions come into play with that, right? Sometimes this is why people use drugs or abuse alcohol, because I'm just trying to get a break, man. Dang, I'm just trying to catch a break. 
Sometimes that's why we get on Facebook. Can I can I tell the truth today? I just feel like I just feel like telling it like it is. Sometimes we 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 adopt an escape from reality because we just want to be free for a minute. Only problem is it doesn't work. It never works, right? You're still left with that same reality, right? The only thing that brings freedom is the, is Christ. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord brings liberty. So, those are some pitfalls. But what's the plan? Trust and obey. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? That when I get in the middle of my stuff, I've got to trust him. And I've got to obey him. Whatever it takes. My mind's got to be prepared. Right? I need to connect with other people. I need to learn how to encourage myself. Have those reminders and a God atmosphere in my life um, that will just help us be successful to that end. Amen? Amen. I love you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time. Lord God, we thank you that you are our God, Lord. We pray that you be with us, Lord, as we leave this place, Lord, and allow us to continue to be in a place to glorify you. And no matter what we go through, that we'll say it is well with our soul. Lord God, we'll say, as Mary said, be it unto me according to your word. Even if I don't understand it, Lord God, that we'll give you the glory, Lord. We thank you for this time, Lord God. Use it, Lord God. Continue to use it and bring it back to our remembrance, Lord God, about you. In Jesus' name, amen.